Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this lunchtime session in Orkney International Science Festival online. Today, we're going to hear about making electric vehicles more efficient, putting motors in the wheels. It avoids the need for the whole transmission system and gives a lighter vehicle with better road holding. We're joined by the founders of the pioneering Slovenian company that developed the concept. We'll also describe how you can make a visual tour to Galloway and the house where James Clark Maxwell developed his electromagnetic theory of light. Professor Tom Stevenson will be along to answer questions and Eric Walker will be joining us with night sky advice for this evening. That's later, but first, electric cars are often in the news as more people buy them and more charging points develop. But their overall design doesn't seem very different from that of ordinary cars. It's just that the power comes from a battery rather than a fuel tank. But a highly innovative company in Slovenia believes it's time for a change. They've replaced the central motor by one in each wheel. And if all goes well, we'll be able to, to take a look now because we've got a, a video of one of the cars using their in-wheel motors in action. That was some acceleration. The company's called Elafa, and they've grown to become market leaders with much investment in research and development, and the company's received numerous awards. We're fortunate today to have the two founders with us, and between them, they have a remarkable range of talents. Goraz Lampic has been chief executive since 2006. In the early days, he led the technical and commercial operations. Today, he's focused on company management and strategy. Gorazd is also a passionate physicist, an athlete, and a chess player. And with him is Andre Detala, physicist, inventor, philosopher, and writer. Andre has a deep interest in Eastern philosophies. He's traveled much in India and Japan, and he is also an extremely welcome visitor to Orkney to give science festival talks, which Andre always generate much interest. So welcome to you both, to Andre and to Gorazd. And I would like to start with a, a question for you, Goraz, to, to put the motors into the wheels. It's a huge stay, step to take. First of all, can I ask, what are the advantages of doing it? Yes, definitely. So, you know, the cars have not changed much in the last century um, and uh, from the user perspective. So typically in our cars, you know, even the fancy brands, we are just in cockpits like in Formula One, you know, squeezed in a seat between the seat and the steering wheel. But um, there are new opportunities, you know, if you release some space inside the vehicle for more comfort, and uh, then you know you can have a vehicle which is prepared for the new era for the vehicles that are connected autonomous that you can share them and it uh, gives you more like a feeling that you're in a living room not so much in in a vehicle with all the other new technologies this will change and you know we're happy to be part of this trend are there, are there challenges disadvantages of course, so it's uh, it was always uh, you know challenging to put enough torque, enough power into a very limited space inside the wheel. You know there is a brake already there dissipating the heat. Uh, then there is a lot of vibration. You know there is uh, there is uh, humidity, moisture, water, and uh, the motor has to be at the same time very compact and to provide uh, suitable performance. Uh, but uh, with the innovation in the electromagnetic design of the motor and then with mechanical design, we were able to squeeze the very compact active part of the motor between the brake and the rim. Uh, and we demonstrated that this is not just for some small golf carts, but it actually can drive also bigger passenger cars. 
And uh, maybe, maybe as a direct input to this uh, science festival, it's interesting to point out that the origin of this is actually in, in science. You know, so it's not just the engineering, but it is the, uh, the breakthrough development and innovation in the electromagnetic topology of the motor and the new materials and new control strategies that then later enable this product to be uh, used in the vehicle. And going back to now to the original concept, Andre, how did how did that idea come up? Because it was it was something really radical. Uh, well, <clears throat> the original idea came from biology. You know that uh, every animal in nature uh, has um, the muscles in each separate limb. Uh, an animal doesn't have a central muscle for uh, all four limbs, but uh, each limb has uh, a separate muscle, and this makes uh, uh, this uh, being very, um, very um, uh, adaptive to the environment, so uh, uh, <clears throat> much more nimble and uh, uh, flexible. So uh, if this concept is transferred from biology to technology, to science, uh, to natural sciences, then we see that um, we can, uh, we can uh, use the same idea in the cars too. Well, with the old gasoline motor, it was impossible to put a motor into each separate wheel. But with the advance of electricity, this becomes possible. The fusion of biology and technology is called bionics. The science of bionics, we know that many ideas came from biology into modern technology, for, for instance, the development of aeroplanes. The winds are quite often modeled on the winds of, uh, of uh, birds or some other animals, um, bats uh, and others. Uh, so um, this, <clears throat> this same idea can be used also uh, uh, in, in the cars. Well, um, as Goros has already said, uh, it was not so easy to realize uh, this because the motor must have a, a, a considerable torque because there are no gears in the wheel. Each, uh, so it's the same with the first and the fifth gear. So there is, uh, uh, this is direct uh, drive and without any mecha uh, mechanical transmission. So the torque must be very great. Uh, and so uh, more than 500 Newton meters, usually more than 1,000 or 1,500 Newton meters of peak torque in each wheel. But in the same time, the motor must be quite light with very low mass because the wheel should not be heavy. If, if the wheel was heavy, then the car could not adapt the road. There would be too much of uh, vibrations in the cabin. And so we, we made a quite, uh, quite a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, of work uh, to um, develop these motors to some mature level. Well, it's, it's amazing to see that. I keep thinking about that, that, uh, that acceleration. And Goraz, I wonder now, the concepts developing, but the challenge always is the market, and there are the, the big players in the market. How has the market been developing? Uh, yeah, definitely. That's interesting. Uh, maybe if we can show a few slides, uh, we can also see some of the some of the uh, customers that we have, and this will this will be interesting. So, well, uh, just go to uh, briefly through the slide decks. So I think you have the control. So this is showing, you know, the market, how it started with hybrids and then full electric vehicles. Now we all know Tesla, but we believe that uh, there will be new vehicles, not just more of the same, you know, in 2020s, but now when everybody already has an electric vehicle, uh, industry is searching for something new. Next slide. And as mentioned previously, you know, so even the traditional car manufacturers need to innovate, you know, they have to be prepared for connected autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, shared electric vehicles with a focus on comfort, driving range, and new technologies. But at the same time, as you have mentioned, you know, indirectly, of course, the cost is also an issue. 
in this uh, traditional industry. So next slide. And uh, as I said, you know, you can imagine not just the in-wheel motor, but the whole platform where uh, the moving parts are inside the wheel. And then the, the rolling chassis or the skateboard, you know, is something that you can put different tops uh, of, for different vehicles. And then you improve all these benefits for cost reduction, reduce complexity, vehicle dynamics, increase the range because the vehicle is lighter and it gives focus to the user or to the mission. But it's, the question is, you know, is this already existing? Uh, next slide. So as shown in the video, you know, uh, definitely yes. And this is also one of our customers. So this is uh, from Ohio, from Lordstown. Uh, there is a company, um, Lordstown Motors, that operates in a General Motors plant. They have received significant amount of funding based on Elafe in-wheel motor technology. So all the technology related to in-wheel motors and power electronics uh, is from, uh, from us. And uh, this enabled them to start on the market with something new. So uh, it's extremely interesting times because this kind, this project and some similar projects are showing that this is not just for you know, some prototypes or for some small companies that are doing this in garage, just converting some of the existing vehicles but this is a real competitor now to all the well-known brands. And then the next slide. This is uh, again from the United States and it's showing something new. So it's a new type of vehicle, you know, not a pickup truck, but something more environmentally friendly, you know, focused on aerodynamics, uh, something that can deliver like a thousand miles of range and can be powered solely by sun. Because if the battery is large enough and you drive for a reasonable range every day and you are recharging constantly with sun, then actually, you know, solar power, solar power can uh, fulfill all the energy requirements. Again, this is a nice concept, you know, enabled by in-wheel motors that we have provided. Next slide. But, uh, you know, the real question is, what are the newcomers to the market? What are the young companies that we know that have to be innovative? And what are the traditional industry players? You know, they're typically lagging behind. So we are just by the book, you know, in the chasm between the fulfilling the needs of early adopters and meeting the demand of early majority. So those uh, early adopters are already asking for large quantities of motors, but the traditional car makers are still slightly hesitating. And we have some first, you know, projects with them that show that they are very serious about using this in the future. Uh, next slide. Um, and well, as we have seen in the video, you know, this is uh, already existing up and running. We built approximately 80 vehicles, different vehicles so far for the testing purpose. And uh, we've shown that uh, uh, good uh, demonstration. So we have high hopes that uh, in the very near future, also the traditional car makers will be forced to use uh, this advanced uh, architecture also in electric vehicles. But maybe you have some additional questions now. Yes, I'm also interested to ask about the, the company's development and the, the, just the, the scale of development ge generally. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have, uh, I think, around 130 employees currently. We grow for like 50% since end of last year. Uh, we operate at around 5,000 square meters. We have uh, several different locations. We are all constantly present in the United States and also in China. Um, so it's, it's a lot of ongoing activities, but we also don't need to do everything on our own. So we also partner a lot with uh, you know, companies that uh, are also in the field of electric mobility and have their own competencies and would like to contribute. So uh, there are several uh, successful partnerships. And here's a, a more general question for you both. The, the car industry is very much a global one. I'm wondering what are the advantages or disadvantages of being based in Slovenia? Um, well, so it's um, Slovenia is the largest manufacturer of electric motors per capita. Uh, it's uh, not huge population, but a lot of electric motors. So definitely there is know-how and talent uh, for electric motors. We also, you know, a lot of suppliers for German, Italian and French automotive industry. So that's why supply chain is very well developed here. Uh, people know about the automotive standards. So from that perspective, it, it's quite good. Also. You know, there were some uh, 
very famous scientists born either in Slovenia or very nearby. So I think we have good foundations also from this uh, perspective. Just as a coincidence, also the, the oldest wheel in the world was found just about 10 kilometers away from headquarters of our company. It about, so it's old about uh, 5,000 years. Uh, so we have a, a wheel related DNA and I think we are making good progress, but uh, maybe Andre can give some additional insight into why, why are we are involved in that. I'm involved in it because of him. So, you know, he, he thought of this idea and then I joined him. So he has to tell the, the origin. Well, we have uh, the oldest wheel, it's uh, 5,300 years old. It was found a few kilometers from when, where we are here now. It was in the mud, so it was well preserved. Um, well, another idea is well, the wheel, it, uh, it makes uh, possible that uh, a carriage is going without uh, a considerable driving force. But another idea is how to put uh, this driving force into the wheel, not, be, be, uh, uh, not at uh, the front of the carriage. So, uh, so, um, so. <laughs> We have made the first step 5,000 years ago, and now we are ready to make the second step too. Well, there was really a lot of um, of uh, of uh, uh, a lot of work to find uh, the um, the correct uh, uh, topology of magnetic fields and electric currents inside this motor. O only this um, this work made possible that the motor has uh, um, uh, enough of uh, specific torque. You know, the, the, uh, no, uh, when we started with this work, no one in the work was able to develop a specific torque of at least 20 Newton meters per kilogram of weight. But now we have several times greater specific torque. So, so only this development made possible so that they put power into each wheel separately. This so is it, so it's yes, somehow, so this is somehow in the air here in Slovenia. So how to put power directly into the wheel as close to the road as possible. So because this is where the power is needed, not in the center of the car, but close to the road. Well, there are exciting times ahead. It's fascinating to hear about the company, about the concept, about its development. Thank you very much to both Andre and Goraz. And I should say to viewers, Andre himself will be joining us on Wednesday morning at half past 11, talking about more of his ideas about physics. We'll be talking about the nature of time and the, the nature of life. And I hope, well, I hope Andre will be back in Orkney to visit us again soon, hopefully next year. And perhaps Goraz, if you have time, could come along as well. You, you would certainly be most welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Thank you indeed. And now, before lunch, we heard the story of James Clark Maxwell, told by Professor Tom Stevenson. And there's an opportunity for everyone to take a, a visual tour of the house where Maxwell lived and worked. It's in Galloway. The house is called Glen Lair. Maxwell developed his ideas about light in a setting of field and woodland with the river running by. For many years, it's been the family home of Captain Duncan Ferguson. He's now very kindly produced a panoramic tour of the grounds, especially for the festival. You can access it through a separate link on the programme page for this event or go to the Science Festival's YouTube channel. The video is approximately six minutes long. It's got views from above and descriptions of the places where Maxwell played as a small boy and where he worked and where he walked in later life. Well, Tom's with us now to respond to questions following his presentation earlier. First of all, Tom, Glen Lair in that film looks a beautiful place, a beautiful place, of course, to visit as well. Just, would you say, the perfect place for a physicist to live and to work? Well, definitely, yes. Um, in 2015, uh, Duncan Ferguson and his family organised an open day um, at Glen Lair. And uh, Winnie and I went along 
and along with, I guess, a uh, hundred or so visitors. And uh, he'd also arranged for Andy and Flora Monroe to be there to entertain us. And in fact, some of the, the Maxwell poems set to music were performed by Andy and Flora uh, in the summer house on the lawn at Glen Lea, which was really very special. And Tom, you're very active in promoting awareness of James Clark Maxwell. And I wondered what's actually going on, because we're now 10 years away from the, from the Maxwell 200th anniversary, which is going to be one of the biggest anniversaries in, in Scottish science. What's actually happening? Well, I recently um, was asked to, to become a trustee of the Clark Maxwell Foundation, which is based uh, in his birthplace, which is 14 India Street um, in Edinburgh. Uh, the, the foundation own that building and uh, they have plans to um, take part in promoting Maxwell, obviously over the next uh, 10 years leading up to the anniversary. And I think you should take credit here for coming up with that concept because um, you pointed out that it's only 10 years to go until uh, the bicentenary. And we should really have a series of events um, every year or more frequently even uh, leading up to that uh, in order to raise his profile. Because if you look at uh, his um, public profile, it, he's hardly known at all um, outside scientific circles. And yet his benefit to mankind, to, to, to the general public, has been absolutely enormous. The technology we're using just now to talk on on Zoom via the web. Um, think of the, all the technology that's involved in that, not just the radio part, but the, the cameras, the, the displays, everything like that, are all based on the, the fundamental work that he did um, more than 150 years ago. So um, there's a lot uh, to be done. And uh, I think what, one of the obvious ways um, is science festivals uh, such as this. Um, where we may attract people who had never heard of him um, to talk about it. Also in schools, um, the school curriculum uh, could perhaps uh, include something about history of science and include people like Maxwell and Kelvin and a whole lot of other great Scottish scientists that are again, um, are fairly obscure in the eyes of the general public. Why do you think it is? Because because it's arguable that Maxwell ranks with Newton and Einstein as the three greatest physicists who have ever lived. Now, if you went down a, any street in Scotland and said the word Newton or the word Einstein, 99 out of 100 people would know. But if you said the word Maxwell, they might think of a publisher. Why, why is there such a, a lack of awareness? I really don't know. Um, <clears throat> I think... Um... Part of this might be um, Scottish modesty. Um, Maxwell was a very modest, quiet guy himself. He didn't shout from the rooftops about his achievements. And there is, a, I think, in, in the Scottish psyche, if you like, a, um, a certain built-in modesty, quite the opposite of some other parts of the world. And maybe in his career, from time to time, he possibly even lost out in... in in the short term by not needing, I don't know, more, more of an administrator or more in, into the system? Indeed, yes. I think um, when he lost out in Aberdeen um, in 1860, when the two colleges merged, um, the guy who was given the, the chair of uh, natural philosophy um, was a guy called David Thompson, who was a, a fairly experienced administrator and perhaps bureaucrat. And he had this nickname, Crafty Thompson, because he'd obviously wangled it that uh, the one uh, position would be his after, after the merger. Who knows? Um, but certainly, um, I think the other thing, um, he lost out in Edinburgh as well. At that time, he applied for the, the chair of natural philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. And his great friend from school, David um, Peter Tate, um, was chosen over Maxwell because Maxwell had a slight speech impediment. I didn't mention this in my talk, but apparently he had a very slight speech impediment. 
and uh, it was felt that his um, ability to um, teach, uh, to give lectures, and particularly public lectures, was not as good as Peter Tate. So that's how he lost out um, on the Edinburgh vacancy. But then he went to King's College and he did very good work there on, on colour imaging and uh, colour vision. Tom, it's a fascinating story. We're going to look forward to hear, hearing more about it. Thank you for joining us indeed. And now it's 10 past one and a star man awaits us. Welcome, Eric Walker. Hello, good afternoon, Howie. It's a pleasure to be back here again. What have you got in store for us to look up to in the night sky tonight? Well, I've got uh, a, a way of looking for the very bright satellites uh, in, in the sky right now. So perhaps if we go to the, the slide presentation. Now, I always try to uh, title my uh, presentations with something to do with Orkney or Scandinavia or the Vikings in particular. And this is a very tenuous, a very tenuous link. Viking was in actual fact a space probe um, and it was launched uh, or the project was managed from Sweden. But however, let's go on with the next slide. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and you've wondered what are these bright moving lights uh, moving slowly across the sky? We have natural satellites such as the moon, but what I'm talking about are the thousands of uh, artificial man-made satellites which orbit our Earth. They're there, they're there to help meteorologists and geologists, the military scientists, astrophysicists, and they give us a bird's eye view that allows us to see large areas of the Earth at one time. They can collect a multitude of data more quickly than instruments on the ground. Next slide. Satellites can also face the other way and they can see into space better than telescopes at the Earth's surface because they're above the clouds, they're above the dust, the molecules in our atmosphere that can block or interfere the, with the view from ground level. You'll have read in the press uh, many recent satellites are, are absolutely key for modern internet communications and they are launched by the dozen, in fact tens of dozen at a time now, they're, you know, they're known as constellations of satellites and me being an astrophotographer I'm especially concerned about those ones. Now many satellites they're visible to the naked eye especially during twilight at dusk and dawn. And some of the very high ones, they're visible throughout the night. It's mainly reflection from their solar panels. They reflect the sunlight, which is below our horizon. And the very, very bright ones, we can actually see even with just our naked eye. Next slide. Now here is a, a, a picture, a one, a one frame from the festival's uh, All Sky Camera. And you can just see there, there is a big, there's a double streak there. That is a satellite flare from two satellites which are passing in the night sky at the same time. You can also see in that uh, image, there's the Milky Way uh, streaking diagonally across the sky and the bright dot at the left-hand edge is Jupiter. Now, in all these images, north is to the right, south is to the left, east is to the top, and west is to the bottom. That's standard astronomical convention. So we go on to the next slide. In my opinion, probably the best satellite that you can observe is the International Space Station. Every few weeks, it becomes visible to us Northern UK observers. Sometimes it's visible early in the morning and sometimes it's visible early in the evening. It's extremely bright now. It has masses of uh, modules on it, each with huge solar arrays. It shines as bright as up to magnitude minus three. Magnitude is a measure of brightness. The lower or more negative the number, the brighter it is. And the space station, as I say, it shines at magnitude minus three. It's about the same as the planet Jupiter currently. It slowly moves from just above the horizon on the west-southwest, peaks about south, and then slowly declines and loses its brightness through to the southeast. The passes are quite long. They can take 
two to four minutes. So you have plenty of time to observe this lovely, slow moving, bright dot in the sky. Next slide, please. Here is a sequence of four uh, frames from uh, the Festival All Sky Camera. You, it goes from top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And if you look in the bottom left, you'll see the streak of the International Space Station. This is because it's a, a long exposure, 30 seconds. And then the next frame shows it's for passing further, passing in the next one, so, so on and so forth. And bear in mind the way that, that, uh, that the configuration is, that's west at the bottom, east at the top, and south at the left. So it's, uh, it's passing, um, if you look generally in the south direction, that's how, that's how you see it. Next slide, please. So how do you locate and observe these satellites from your location? You can just go outside uh, when you've got a clear dark sky, just look up and just hope for the best. Or you can plan in advance and you will almost guarantee that you'll see a host of bright satellites. That can enable you to set up a camera and you can photograph them. And the ISS is so bright that most modern smartphones, you can actually video record the passing of the space station above your location. Next slide. This is the website I use to plan my satellite observation. It's called Heavens Above. It's a website which provides daily satellite predictions and also other astronomical data about the planets, um, the moon, the sun, everything. You can customize it for your location. And being an East Coast Scot, it's free, absolutely in my ballpark. Next slide. You'll go into the website. The first thing you need to do is put in your location. It is easy. You find the map, you click on where roughly your location is. It doesn't have to be exact, just roughly. That's you, you're located, update it. And then next slide, go back to the home page, and you will see the menu on the left hand side. And we're looking at the satellites menu. And there are two elements in there. There is one called daily predictions for brighter satellites. And the other one is ISS. So that's the two I'm going to deal with. You click on each of them. If you go to the next slide, here is the current one. This is the one for today at my location, daily predictions for brighter satellites. Uh, for this evening, and this evening they are going to be visible from about quarter to nine through to about half past uh, 11 British summertime. And you'll notice the, the titles of them, they are often, these brighter ones are actually parts of a rocket launch stages. They're extremely bright. And some of them are fascinating because the rocket stages tumble in space and they flash on flash off some regular some irregular so watch out for those they're really really fascinating if you click on the hyperlinks in the middle uh, of these columns where it says highest point you click on the time link and you will get a sky map and it will show you the constellation that that the, the pass of that satellite is going to take so that makes it even easier for you to find if we go to the next slide this is the one for the International Space Station, and you will see that it is currently visible in the northern UK at this moment in time. It is, unfortunately, visible from about half past three in the morning through to about half past four. So it's, you've got to be up early or uh, up late, whatever way you, you work. Um, but you will see the brightness of the space station. If you look down the brightness column, it's up to about minus 2.8, minus 2.6. That is extremely bright. And the columns tell you what time you can first see it. They'll tell you the altitude and the azimuth, so the position at, um, in, in the compass and the height in the sky. They'll tell you the highest point, and they'll tell you where it finishes. Again, if you click on the hyperlink on the date side, that gives you a little sky map, and it shows you the track that you want to look for. So on to the next slide. Here are some pictures, again, from the Festival All Sky Camera that um, I've taken with the All Sky Camera. And this is a long, slow passing satellite. You see that streak there just at the right hand side of the Milky Way as we look at it. If we go on the next slide, 
This is a flaring satellite. You see that streak. Now you don't see the streak. This is because it's a long exposure. You will see a bright dot moving in the sky and it gets brighter for a while and then it starts to fade again. That's called a flare. Next slide. This was a very bright, slow moving, long moving satellite pass that went basically from the west through to the east. It took a long time, but that was a, a lovely pass. And I've never quite identified that one yet. You do get military satellites, which strangely enough, are not on these uh, databases. So sometimes you wonder what's going on. Next slide, please. And sometimes you get a wonderful surprise when you go through your images uh, and you find that your cat has been trying to take a selfie using the All Sky camera. That's my cat, Marty Cat. So, next slide. That's the bright satellites. Go out, have a look tonight, see what you can find. Tomorrow, I'll be talking about Bifrost, the bridge between Asgard and Midgard, which to all of us we know as the Northern Lights. And I'll tell you how to find them and how to photograph them. Thank you. And thank you indeed, Eric, and may the stars shine bright above you tonight. Our thanks to Tagorazd, Andre and Tom, and to the technical team of Swain, Mick and John, who carried us so smoothly on behind the scenes. At two o'clock, we'll hear how communities can take action on climate change. Dr Bobby McCauley will describe community action across Scotland, from renewable energy to woodland planting. It's this year's Grimmond Lecture, and we're delighted to be joined for it by Magnus Grimmond. In the meantime, from us all, goodbye for now. <laughs>